Hello. I want to thank you so very much for making the choice to join us here once again at the Greenbrier Church Online. If you know me, you know that I often like to communicate ideas and principles through telling stories. And if you've known me for any length of time, you know that I really like a, a good preacher story. I always try to be honest and tell you, I don't know if the story is completely true or just mostly true or if it just makes a great point. But as we get ready to get into our text for this morning, I, I want to begin with a story that I heard a preacher tell several years ago about a Miss Wanda Johnson from Savannah, Georgia. Miss Johnson was on her way to the pawn shop. She was going to have to pawn off her television in an effort to pay her utility bill. On her way to the pawn shop, she noticed that uh, there was a bag in the middle of the road that looked like one of those bags that people would take their receipts at the end, end of the day to the bank. So she pulls off on the side of the road, she gets out, she picks up the bag, and sure enough, it's a bank bag from SunTrust Bank. She got back into her car and opened the bag to discover the bag was full of money, $120,000 to be exact. Immediately she began to wonder, is this a gift from God, or do I get to keep this money, or if I do, I don't have to pawn my television. There, there's enough money in this bag to pay my utilities for several years. But the more she thought about it, the more she understood exactly what she needed to do. She pulled off from the side of the road and drove down to the closest SunTrust bank and turned the bag and all the money in. Later, she would tell the local newspaper that she was tempted to keep the money and just not tell anyone. You see, the money would have been a definite blessing in her life, but in her heart, she knew that it wasn't her money. She imagined that somebody somewhere was panicked and in a great deal of distress over losing that bag of money. So what do you do in those situations? Do you obey your feelings or do you do what's right? Over the last few weeks, we've been camped out in Philippians 4.8, and it's been my intention to share some of the boundaries that Paul establishes if we want to find peace and joy in our lives. We've already noticed over the last two weeks that there is incredible freedom that comes when we think about whatever is true and whatever is honorable. Today, we come to the third boundary, and that's the boundary of thinking about whatever is righteous. So I want to read our text again, but today I want to read it from the complete Jewish Bible. In conclusion, brothers, focus your thoughts on what is true, noble, righteous, pure, lovable, or admirable, on some virtue or on something praiseworthy. Keep doing what you have learned and received from me, what you have heard and seen me doing. Then the God who gives shalom will be with you. To the average person living in first century Rome, being right referred to a certain kind of behavior. Living a, a righteous life was seen in your ability to conform to the customs of the day. You were civilized, law-abiding, and responsible. If you fulfilled your civic duties, if you were a good citizen of the Roman Empire, you were considered righteous. If you paid your bills on time, you honored your commitment, you told the truth, you were considered righteous. If you fulfilled your obligation, if you kept your words, people would call you righteous. Really, if your good deeds outweighed your bad deeds, then you were living a righteous life. The Jews understood that living in the culture, but their understanding of righteousness went a little deeper than just fulfilling your commitments and keeping your word. Time and time again, the Torah contrasted people who were righteous and people who were wicked. And there's not really any middle ground. You're not kind of righteous. You're not partially wicked. You're not mostly wicked or barely righteous. You were either living a righteous life or you were following the path of the wicked. The book of Proverbs sets this out pretty plainly when we read, the way of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, which shines ever brighter until the full light of day. But the way of the wicked is like total darkness. They have no idea what they're stumbling over. The wicked flee, though no one pursues, but the righteous 
are as bold as a lion. To the guy on the street who'd never read the book of Proverbs, as well as the Israelites who had memorized the Torah, the idea of righteousness was all about being a good person, doing the right thing, fulfilling your obligations to other people and to God. It's like turning in a bag of money that you found lying in the street. I would imagine that each one of us kind of have the same idea. We tend to equate righteousness with being a good person. So we hold the door open for someone when we're leaving or entering a building. We allow other people to merge into traffic as long as they didn't come from too far back behind the line. We help people get things off the top shelf. We even allow someone to to get in front of us at the grocery store if we have a week's full of grocery and and they just have bread and milk. All the things that we used to call manners and the things that we expected everyone to do have come to represent righteous living. Now, I believe that we need to to be kind. I believe that we need to show compassion and have good manners, but that's not what Paul's talking about. You see, Paul doesn't say act righteous. He says that we are to focus our thoughts to meditate on whatever is righteous. And so, I guess the real question that I'm faced with today is not, am I acting like a good person, but why am I acting like a good person? What motivates my behavior? Why why do we even attempt to be a good person? Why are you making the decision to say no when it would be much easier for you to say yes? Why are you trying to put yourself before others How do you honestly answer those questions? Is the way that you're acting in an effort to get something that you don't already have? Or is it because you've already been given something and you're living out of thanksgiving? When we get to the New Testament, the word righteous begins to take on a different meaning. Instead of talking about and meaning doing the right things, being righteous means that we are given credit for doing the right thing even if we don't do it. In his letter to the church at Rome, Paul really unpacks this idea of how we receive the credit for living a righteous life, even when we don't do everything right. In the first two and a half chapters, Paul takes time to go into great detail describing how utterly sinful we are. He talks about the failure of the Gentiles, and then he takes some time to reveal the failures of the Jews, and he paints a pretty bleak picture of their refusal to live a righteous life before God. And then he gets to Romans chapter 3, verse 20, and he writes, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by observing the law. There were Christians in Rome who had bought into this lie that they can only be justified if they kept the law. They were miserable because they're so overly focused on every detail of the law and giving this appearance that they were being faithful in living a righteous life. Now, Paul is thankful for the law. He understands the law serves as a guideline for what it is to live a righteous life. But the problem that each and every one of us have with the law is that we're not able to do enough good to be declared right before God. Because each and every one of us, we we drift towards sin. Every one of us, without exception, chooses to do what we know is wrong sometimes. So what do you do when you've sinned? Well, Most people think that the answer is to just merely balance the scales in our favor. I'm not sure where we got this idea, but there seems to be this thought that our lives are on on a balanced scale. So when we do something good, we put a few marbles on the good side of the scale. And when we sin and we act selfishly, then we got to put some marbles on the bad side of the scale. Living a righteous life comes down to making sure that we put more marbles on the good side than on the bad side. At Judgment Day, we think we're going to stand before God and we're going to have our scale with us. And if the good side is heavier, we get to go to heaven. But if we didn't do enough, if the bad side is heavier, well, you should probably pack some shorts and a couple of cold beverages. 
When we buy into that type of belief, we put a lot of time and effort into thinking and doing things that we falsely believe will help us stack up all of the marbles on the good side of the scale. We feed the hungry by taking food to a food shelter, and that's got to go on the good side because Jesus talked about feeding the people that are hungry. Um, We go out and we buy presents for the kids uh, on those trees at the mall. And Jesus said that we should help the less fortunate. So giving Christmas presents to children should add some marbles to the good side of our scale. And I know that right now there's a lot of other things that you could be doing. I mean, this is the last weekend of the summer. It's a three-day weekend. But you made the choice to sit and to watch this sermon And even though you're not technically in a church building, I mean, this is kind of like church, right? And Jesus went to church. I mean, every time you turn a page, it's like Jesus is going into a synagogue or going into the temple. And so you're doing all of these things. And you kind of feel bad for the people that aren't taking advantage of the opportunities they have right now to, to weigh down the good side of the scale. I mean, by the time they realize that they need to, they're going to have a lot of work to do. They're going to have to bake a cake for some sick person or pick up the leaves at their elderly neighbor's yard because somewhere, somebody's keeping up with the marbles and we don't want to get to the point where we can never do enough to outweigh the sins we committed. Go back and look at what Paul's teaching in Romans 3. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by observing the law. There's not a whole lot you can do with this passage to make it say something else. Paul is very clear. You don't achieve righteousness with God by being good. We're given righteousness by a good God, which means there's nothing that you can do or I can do that will ever tip the scales in our favor. Martin Luther called this alien righteousness. He taught that there's a righteousness that comes from beyond us, from heaven above. The righteousness is this undeserved gift from God to sinful people. It's God's way of saying to sinful, broken people, I am for you. I am on your side. So if your relationship with God's not like a balance uh, where you have to pile up as many good marbles as you can to outweigh the bad marbles... What does that mean for us? And does that mean that in our story today, Wanda Johnson, she might have earned the respect of her peers when she turned in that money? She might have been blessed by the GoFundMe account that the people in her community set up to pay her utility bills when the story appeared on the nightly news. But does that mean she didn't get any marbles on the scale to balance it in her favor? She didn't receive any more grace from God because she chose to do the right thing? The obvious question we're faced with is the same question that the Christians in Rome struggled with. God promises to freely give me the righteousness I need, even though I don't deserve it. I simply recognize that I'm a sinner. I'm completely incapable of being good enough to earn God's forgiveness. So I confess my sins. I acknowledge that I'm in debt, eternally lost without Him. I act on my faith by following Him in baptism And God abundantly pours out all over my life the things that I can't earn. And if all of that is true, then why are you working so hard trying to be righteous when God will do all the work for you? I mean, honestly, being a Christian seems a whole lot easier than we thought. Just let God do all the work. There's no need to try to be good when God's just going to pass out goodness like Halloween candy. Well, that's something else the Christians in Rome were struggling with. Some of them had bought into this dangerous teaching. You just live however you want to live. God promises to give you all the grace that you need. And the more you sin, the more grace you receive. And grace is this beautiful gift. The only way to get more grace is to sin more. So it's the best of both worlds. Sin and like it's your job and let God pay you with grace. And when confronted with that type of thinking, Paul said, do we continue to sin so that God's kindness and grace will increase? What a terrible thought! We died to sin. How can we still live in it? Paul understood that thinking on whatever is right doesn't mean just being given credit for something we didn't do. There's another meaning. It also means fulfilling our obligations to God and to others. 
Righteousness isn't just something you get, it's something you do. Luther not only talked about alien righteousness, but he also talked about proper righteousness, or the righteousness that that comes from within. If alien righteousness is God's way of saying to us sinners, I am for you, then proper righteousness is our way of replying to God, and I'm for you. We respond to God's beautiful gift of righteousness by living a life that's worthy of the gift. In every aspect of your life, in your decisions, your priorities, your behavior, thinking about what is righteous is how you say to God, I'm for you, I'm on your side, I choose to be on your team. We're spending time working through verse 8, focusing on the part that talks about the boundaries of things that we're free to think about, the things that are true and noble and right and pure. But let's not take the passage out of context. Because in context, in verse 9, Paul continues and says, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. In verse 8, Paul sets up these beautiful boundaries of freedom and peace. In verse 9, we're called to live out those boundaries or live out what we discover in those boundaries. Verse 8 invites us to think. Verse 9 invites us to do. We don't just think about being righteous. We're called to live righteous lives, responsible lives. Lives that say, God, I'm so thankful that you are for me. And out of my thanksgiving, I want to be for you. That's what Wanda Johnson did. She did the responsible thing, the right thing, the righteous thing. Even when she didn't really feel like doing it. She said the temptation to keep the money was strong. She wanted to keep the money. Of course she did. I mean, put yourself in her situation. She's on her way to pawn off her television so she could pay her light bill. If you were in her circumstances and you found a bag of money, wouldn't you want to keep it? Or at least some of it? Temptation is only temptation if you really want to do it. I mean, if you don't care, if you could take it or leave it, that's not temptation. Temptation is when it's something that you're drawn to do. Temptation is something that we really want to do, something we feel like doing, something that we long to do, something that fires our passions, excites our senses, pulls at our heart with this almost irresistible force. Righteous living most often means doing the opposite of what you feel like doing. It's saying no when when everybody around you is saying yes. It's walking away when you would really rather stay. Or it's staying when you would really rather run. It's forgiving when you feel like holding a grudge. It's encouraging and supporting other weary travelers by meeting with them when you feel like staying at home. The truth is that you do all of these things not because you're trying to balance any scale in your favor. You do these things because you know that God's already thrown the scale away, and He's called you His own. Whenever we think about what is true, we focus on Christ. Whenever we think about what is honorable, we we think about the church and our responsibility to the culture and our community. And today, we're being called to think about whatever is righteous, and that causes us to dwell on God's amazing grace. You see, Before God ever called you to do anything, He already poured out His love and His grace, His mercy, His strength, His compassion, and His forgiveness all over your life. God has already given us everything that we need, and once we've received the gift, that's when He invites us to join Him by living out our thanksgiving and appreciation We go to the table today to be reminded of what God has already done in our lives. It's a time of celebration. It's a time when we think about the peace and the joy that God pours out in our community that exists in our relationship with Him. So today as you take the bread and the cup, it's my prayer that you'll take the time to focus on whatever is righteous. 
And while you focus and you dwell upon the righteousness of God, your joy will be made complete.